turning south, south of Egypt uh, to sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we now get to the Bantu migrations and early agricultural societies in sub-Saharan Africa. Remember, uh, in the uh, introduction, I pointed out that these uh, peoples, the Bantu-speaking peoples, uh, fanned out. Uh, you can see the uh, lines of movement there in general with the gold arrows uh, and had a gigantic uh, outsized influence uh, on subsequent uh, African history in a big, uh, uh, over a large geographical area uh, in sort of many different uh, cultural groups. Uh, one uh, expert on this, uh, Professor Stavrianos, world history expert, uh, says immigration became preferable to a continued life as a perpetual junior in an overcrowded homeland. So one of the reasons that they apparently started to move, not all at once, uh, was that this is an area you know, that a lot of people com competed over. Uh, and so remember, one of the strategies for human beings going way back to our first unit uh, was uh, you know, to avoid conflict, sometimes uh, just leave and go find somewhere else to live which sometimes created its own problems because uh, uh, not all land that you move into uh, is uninhabited. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this is a, a strategy uh, oft tried uh, throughout the world. Stavrianos goes on to say the movement of the Bantu peoples from West Africa to Central, Eastern, and Southern Africa has often been described as a migration, but it was a gradual movement of small numbers of people who often intermarried with the people in the areas they infiltrated. The Bantu were in the area of the Congo by the 5th century BCE, but the widespread use of iron between the 2nd and 5th centuries CE allowed the Bantu to move more quickly to the rest of the southern portion of the continent. So uh, they were known for uh, advanced uh, metallurgy uh, as sort of one of their uh, technologies uh, and uh, a big part of uh, you know, uh, their uh, uh, thriving uh, in all of these areas. Their knowledge of agriculture uh, spread to uh, much of sub-Saharan Africa, so they brought their uh, know-how, uh, their experience, uh, their wisdom uh, with regard to how to uh, till the soil uh, with them. So that's one example of many uh, of sort of their cultural influence on uh, other parts of Africa when they got there and you know, settled uh, in over the generations. Uh, so in yet another area, uh, we've seen, we see, we've already seen it in two areas, Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, another area of the world, agriculture becomes the economic foundation of society uh, in a somewhat different way here in Africa that we'll have uh, cause to come back and look at uh, more in another unit. We now get to the Niger-Congo language family. Uh, this uh, comes from the uh, field of linguistics, fascinating uh, subject to study. Uh, the you know uh, history of language in a sense and language today uh, the Niger Congo language family uh, according to uh, an anthropologist uh, writing a book out the about the earliest uh, farmers uh, uh, you know, uh, in agricultural societies the Niger Congo langu language family is largest in the world uh, in terms of number of languages 1436 according to one source with possibly 300 million speakers. The whole family, language family that is, uh, and especially its Bantu subgroup, so the Bantu are sort of within this uh, language family, covers a vast area of sub-Saharan Africa with almost no survivals of substratum languages, meaning uh, that this uh, language uh, group uh, kind of spread through uh, uh, the area, there are all the colored regions you see on the map there, uh, from yellow to green to purple, uh, starting with purple and then down to the uh, tan area, uh, and uh, basically got, uh, eliminated their languages. Uh, not like by force, but uh, apparently uh, the language uh, was more attractive, and for whatever reason, uh, it took hold uh, and tended to crowd out the other languages. Uh, uh, and sort of, is, you know, the language was you know, uh, very competitive and ultimately victorious, one could say. The Western Bantu, kind of dividing between west and east, uh, with pottery, uh, oil palms, uh, and yams, uh, per or perhaps uh, moving southward in the west African rainforest by around 3000 BP, eventually moving into the savannas of Angola. Uh, the rainforest region was quite densely settled by 1000 uh, years ago. Uh, same uh, author uh, here uh, on early farmers, 
in this case in Africa, the Eastern Bantu groups began to spread eastward, hence Eastern Bantu, along the northern fringes of the rainforest to reach Lake Victoria by around 3,000 years ago. They came in contact with cattle herders, millet cultivators, uh, uh, and also with hunter-gatherers. Uh, from the former groups, they adopted sorghum and pearl millet to add to their predominantly tuberous uh, domesticated plant roster, domesticated uh, various forms of tubers, these types of tubers. They also acquired iron metallurgy and a little later uh, added cattle, sheep, donkeys, and chickens. So it wasn't a one-way street. Uh, what I've said uh, heretofore showed the Bantu uh, speaking peoples influencing other peoples uh, You know, when, when they moved into those people's regions, but it went in their direction as well. The Bantu were picking up uh, knowledge and know-how uh, in a cultural exchange uh, uh, you know, that, that benefited them as well. But they're, you know, of course, mixing into these societies in most cases as well. The Bantu dispersal, meaning migrations, was one of the most dramatic examples of farming dispersal in world history. Uh, and there's quite remarkable agreement between the archaeological and linguistic records on its reality. So translated, that's saying that this is one of the biggest spreads of agriculture ever, uh, anywhere in the world. It could possibly be the biggest one. Uh, so uh, a dramatic example of agriculture kind of coming from one, uh, you know, for a fairly... Uh, uh, localized uh, place and space and moving uh, fairly rapidly uh, to, to uh, a much larger population over a much larger geographic area. Social structure and Bantu societies, uh, this coming from our lovable authors Bentley and Ziegler, most Bantu and other peoples lived in communities of a few hundred individuals led by chiefs. Many groups known as age sets or age grades consisting of individuals born within a few years of one another, uh, uh, members of each group, each stage set, jointly assumed responsibility for tasks appropriate to the, their levels of strength, energy, maturity, and experience. During their early years, members of an age set might perform light public chores. At maturity, members jointly underwent elaborate initiation rites that introduced them to adult society. Older men cultivated fields and provided military service, while women tended to domestic chores and traded at markets. In later years, members of age sets served as community leaders and military officers. So uh, I point this feature of uh, Bantu society out simply because we haven't seen it yet. Uh, we haven't seen age sets. Now, surely in all societies, you could say, you know, different age groups kind of do different things to a certain degree but uh, not structured into the social system uh, through tradition and custom you know, in a more formalized way as here. So this is something different than, you know, something more than just saying, well, we'll kind of, uh, young people do this, and people, when they get to middle age, they do this, and then they retire and, and, do, and do that. Uh, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's more structured into the whole system. As far as sub-Saharan African uh, religious practices and beliefs are concerned, uh, some, uh, a pretty large number of African uh, peoples uh, believed in a monotheistic, impersonal deity, uh, of one God uh, that was a source of good and evil. Or, uh, uh, we, we could say, uh, in many cases, believed in one primary, you know, very powerful God and a bunch of lesser, uh, a bunch of lesser gods. So kind of a combination uh, in some places of monotheism and polytheism. Uh, one god, multiple gods. Uh, they believed in some places that uh, this sort of powerful, impersonal god uh, created the universe, the world, and then stepped away after creation, much as the European deists uh, believed. Uh, didn't pray directly to God, partly for that reason. God wasn't there. He stepped away for, for, forever. Uh, divine force uh, could take the form of specific spirits uh, in uh, African religions, uh, and there were a number of different ones, uh, but most of these are kind of, uh, I think, rightfully grouped under uh, animistic religion or animism, S similar to, not exactly, uh, to Native American religions uh, uh, in the Americas. So uh, animism, in part, uh, uh, was a belief in multiple gods or spirits uh, that, that lived in and among the people, uh, so uh, in villages and 
settlements. Uh, they were invisible, but they were supposed to be right there. Uh, wasn't a distant. Uh, these weren't distant spirits like the creator god that sort of you know went away forever, way back uh, you know, at the beginning of time. Uh, they also prayed to uh, ancestor uh, and personal spirits. So prayed to their ancestors. Uh, so there are other peoples we'll, we'll see in the world that uh, have ancestor worship as a, a part, a big part of their religion. Uh, the ancestors were often seen to intervene in the world. Uh, uh, like the spirits, and again, could sort of dwell among the, the people, just not to be seen, but certainly could be, uh, their will uh, could be felt, and believe that they might, you know, uh, achieve or try for retribution uh, if you didn't appease them or worship them and honor or honor them. Uh, proper attention uh, was given to those uh, spirits uh, uh, or proper rituals, you know, as, uh, you know, attention as rituals to these spirits would ensure good fortune. Uh, their neglect would bring punishment or adversity from disgruntled spirits. Uh, so the emphasis on such religious uh, uh, systems uh, is uh, on orthopraxy or proper practice, not on orthodoxy, a term you're probably more familiar with, which means proper belief. So certainly they had religious beliefs, uh, but uh, the practice of religion uh, kind of uh, was uh, emphasized more than the beliefs. In some other religions, uh, some of which we'll see in this class, it's the other way around. They have uh, important practices, uh, but they consider the belief system, uh, the orthodoxy, uh, more important than the orthopraxy. So this is an orthopraxy first religion, uh, and orthopraxy first uh, in a way means a little bit selfish. I don't mean in a bad way. Uh, uh, selfish uh, in the sense that the religious practices, ceremonies, rituals, rites are conducted uh, in a specific way by priests who are experts in you know, doing them the right way. They've learned it from, you know, passed down through the generations. Uh, but uh, to say, uh, do certain uh, rituals to bring about plentiful rainfall. Uh, so uh, they have, uh, you know, lots of crops to feed the community. Or another set of rituals, uh, and ceremonies to uh, bring success in war against enemies, etc. So meaning that the religious practice was at least in large part designed to bring favorable social outcomes in the actual, in the real world. Uh, and it was believed, of course, that they, if the rituals were practiced properly, done properly, that they would bring uh, those kind of positive outcomes.